Hey guys, Scott Kriega of Respiratory Therapy. Um, I've been a therapist for about 20 years now. Um, I was asked to do kind of a thing on ARDSnet, so I was going to do a little uh, vignette on that. I'm kind of borrowing from my uh, ECHO presentation. I do the ECHO uh, ARDS uh, case study uh, for the new nurses that get into the ICU, so I'm just going to kind of be, uh, borrow um, from a few slides here, okay? Um, so this is just a little review. For those that um, already are working in the ICUs, um, and you'll see that in a minute. Uh, sometimes it's nice to look back. Um, and for the newbies, um, it uh, hopefully will explain a little bit better about how we roll with uh, with ventilation. Um, let me get to the spot where I was going to get started. So with ARDS, um, it's a you know a supportive disease. You just try to keep them alive and let them get through the course, you know, because it's just an overwhelming systemic inflammation. Um, you know, you support the blood pressure and the major organs as in order. But, you know, from what we do from a ventilator standpoint is we want to reduce the uh, amount of damage that we cause um, using a positive pressure ventilator because we normally breathe with negative pressure. This is we're applying positive pressure now once we put in a breathing tube and we blow up the cuff. All right. Um, I've been a therapist since uh, 1995. Um, and um, we've learned a lot about the lung since then, but we still have a 40 to 50 percent mortality rate for ARDS. So it's important um, that we need to do the things that we can do um, to decrease the amount of damage that we cause because the ventilator is a weapon. Um, but normally we have a pH of 7.35, 7.40, and we want our CO2 40, and we want our PO2 80 or better. Um, that's, that's a normal. That's exactly it. It's a normal lung. Uh, these ARDS lungs are far from normal. So for us to expect that uh, normal level from our pHs and our, our acid-base status is just unreasonable. So we have to lower our targets. And by doing that, reducing some of the things that cause damage. Stretch injury, over-distension of good lung tissue, um, repetitive collapse of thin tissues, and then they're forced to rub together and again and again and again and again every breath. And then finally, high FiO2s, um, concentrations greater than 60, have been shown to release free radicals that are potent inflammation mediators that start that cytokine process. And what we know about ARDS is, is it's, a, it's an inflammation, a systemic inflammation about the lungs, um, that if we don't do anything about that cytokine release, all right, by finding and fixing the trigger, this is trigger kitty here, um, you may not recover. Those patients may not recover. Um, so we have to do our part, which is the ventilator management piece. Okay? Here is the uh, lung curve, pressure volume. I love this curve. I always say that I'm going to get a tattoo of this one day. Um, but this, this really, in a nutshell, signifies what we need to do. Pressure is this way, and volume is this way. Um, so as I apply pressure, I get an increase in volume. Hold on a second. All right, sorry about that. So as I'm applying pressure, I should see an increase in volume. That's what this is going to tell me. And here is inspiration all the way up to here, and then is expiration right there. And what we're seeing is as I apply pressure right here, okay, we're forcing some collapsed segments to kind of open up a little bit. And then once they get all nice and open, then it gets easy to ventilate. Okay, so we're on easy street right up until about here. And then as we keep applying pressure, we've gone past the point of good return. And as we see an increase uh, in pressure, I see very little increase in volume here. That's bad. That's over distension or stretch injury of good lung tissue. Down here, I see a big increase in pressure, very little change in volume. And that is collapsed segments that are kind of forced to rub together a little bit. This is the shearing damage. So what we need to do is set our PEEP pressures our PEEP again, PEEP pressures, again above the lower inflection point. That didn't sound right. It sounded like I was saying peak pressures. But it's PEEP that we're trying to set above here. We don't want this to happen each and every breath. Up here, we don't want to be up in this range, the dreaded beak. Okay, So we try to ventilate in the nice zone right here. This is the safe zone. Okay, All right, so we reduce our tidal volumes to stay below this and we set our peep high enough to stay above this. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> it can be challenging, okay? Um, this, up, by the way, is where um, we check when we're doing our bivent, our pressure high. This is where we check our plateaus. This is value is telling us where our plateaus are, okay? 
Um, and we know that we should be keeping our plateaus less than 30, and, and the uh, ArsNet will be reflecting that. I'll show you that, okay? Um, but this is what we're trying to do. All right. Now, with that said, ventilator strategies. A New England Journal of Medicine uh, landmarking study came out in 2000. It really has not been supplanted as the gold standard. And really what it did is it had a multi-center trial, all right? We always love when it's multi-centered and random control arms, okay? So they had one that they were ventilating ARDS-type patients. And this was back with the American uh, European Conference um, in 1994 definition, which had ARDS and ALI. The Berlin different, um, definition nowadays gets rid of the ALI, and it just it was the ARDS with levels of se severity for hypoxia. Um, but anyway, this study said... One group gets 10 mils to 10 to 12 mils per kg, and then the other group gets the 6 to 8 mils per kg. All right, and what they found is they had to stop the study, um, you know, uh, sooner than they expected. They wanted more patients in there, but there was such a difference between mortality in this lower tidal volume strategy group than the higher tidal volume strategy. So, with ARDS, we start here at about six, and we work our way down to four in order to keep that plateau less than 30 right there, okay? Um, ArsNet, you know, 50 different centers participated in these trials, okay, and they came up with a ventilator protocol card, which is, you know, a little front-back deal. So there's two pages. This is the first page, and as you can see, it's very busy. Well, it's a protocol card. There's supposed to be a lot of information on there, but let's weed through this a little bit, and you'll find that it's not too bad because, remember, our objective on basically everybody should be this, all right. We want to reduce the overdistension of the good lung tissue. Don't cause that inflammation process. We want to reduce the FiO2 less than 60% because we know higher concentrations than 60% will cause free radical release and potentially cytokine release. Inflammation again. Shearing. We don't want to set the peep low enough where we have rubbing together of, of thin tissues. This is the shear. You know, talking about this shear right here, I always use the balloon analogy. As you start to blow up that balloon, it's really hard, right? initially and then once you get it kind of open it gets nice and easy well this is what's happening here that's the nice and easy part the really hard part is this and the lungs operate in a similar fashion there okay um, but anyway back to the protocol card let's see if we can weed that out so inclusion criteria all right this this is kind of a list right here but it doesn't matter it's it's for patients that we cannot ventilate and oxygenate will automatically start to be managed this way we do this every day um, again, this is a generality protocol, meaning this is kind of guidelines. People fine-tune this in different institutions, and we are no different, though, okay? Um, ideal body weight. This is all this is talking about right here, all right? Lower RPO2 targets. Remember, normally 80 and above is better. Here, we can get, you know, somewhat mildly hypoxic, and that's fine. We lower our FiO2 to achieve this, all right? If you want to go with SATs and you believe the SATs, that's fine. Just go by these numbers here, okay? There's two ways that you can do this. You have a lower PEEP, higher FiO2 can, um, you know, chart, or you have a higher PEEP, lower FiO2. Whichever one you choose to go with, use that amount of PEEP, okay? Um, 0.8 FiO2, let's say we can't get a FiO2 less than 80%, we should be at 22 of PEEP, which signifies that our lower inflection point is around 22 centimeters at that particular time for that particular sick lung. Okay? Plateau pressures. Remember, we don't want to be out here, so anything above this point right here can be bad. Plateau pressures less than 30 is what we're shooting for, and we will reduce our tidal volumes. Remember, starting with 6, we will reduce them by 1 cc per kg to get to 4 in, in order to achieve that. That's all. Okay, then we will go up on our respiratory rate as needed because our tidal volumes have gone down, right? So our respiratory rate must go up or we're not going to be clearing off enough acid, all right, just to keep that pH in a lower target, okay? And I showed you some arrows of what I wanted to point out right there. So again, this is what we're, we're trying to do. Now, page two is about the pH. 7.3 is the high end of our accepted value right there. We want to wean to a lower pH target. Again, this is not a perfect lung. We cannot expect perfect numbers, so we need to allow for lower values. Most of the uh, uh, literature, we fine-tune our lung uh, to 7.25, okay? And we let the CO2 be whatever it wants to be. 
permissive hypercapnia is what we call that. And this is exactly what that's pointing out right there. Um, for patients that are younger, uh, less comorbidities, we could even lower our pH values um, to 7.2, 7.17, something like that. Um, with a patient that's older, higher comorbidities, um, we need to be closer to the 7.3 goal, okay, because we don't want that vasoconstrictive response, which dumps a bunch of catecholamines, which makes your blood pressure medicine less effective, um, and then we get into an overwhelming acidosis. And if we if we have to, we have to give some bicarb to kind of, you know, dissociate into bicarbonate acid so we can breathe off more PCO2. Um, that may be done. Now, this bicarb, we tend not to frown up because it's, it's a temporary measure, and we're just trying to keep them alive at that point, okay? Um, sooner or later, uh, overwhelming acids start to ensue, and then you have eventually have a multi-system shutdown um, because of the vasorestrictive uh, response there, all right? And then that that is it, really. The rest of this is just spontaneous breathing trials, which we're going to do every day, provided they are on values that are not greater than 45% on our FiO2 and PEEP values greater than 8 all right, anybody else, we're going to evaluate them for a weaning trial, though, okay? That's the ARDSNET protocol, guys. Now, I know you're saying, okay, what about bivent? What about the oscillator? What about prone in our patients? What about diuretics? You know, all that stuff. Relax. They'll be there. But here is the ARDSNET. There's these two pages summed up in a nutshell. Keep plateau pressures less than 30. We don't want over distension of good lung tissue. pH is of 725. I don't care what the CO2 is. Respiratory rate up to 35. And then... PEEP values, we've got to set it right to reduce our FiO2 to 60 or less. All right, we can allow for higher uh, um, uh, higher levels of uh, hypoxia, okay? And Dr. Norcross always tells me, he says, Scott, perfect is the enemy of good enough, so i got to give him credit for that one because I, I love that phrase. They're not perfect lungs. We cannot expect perfection, all right? We have to allow for good enough, okay? Now, there's times where these don't work, all right? And we have to go, oh, boy, what are we going to do now? All right? And that's where these strategies come into play as rescue therapies. And this is where our bivents, our oscillators, our diuretic therapy, prone therapy, inhaled flow lands, you know, ECMO, all of this stuff, okay? Um, when they get super, super stick, sick, we, uh, we, take their, uh, we take their guts out and uh, lay them in a little bag outside of their chest to make them more compliant. All right, burn patients get uh, escherotomy to cut the connective tissue to make it less stiff. Now, this prone therapy, interesting here. Um, this one came out uh, 2013, okay, and this one was a multi-center trial. We like that. A lot of patients, we like that. So I think there was 237 in the prone arm, 229 in the supine arm. What this one did, in fact, show was uh, we had a mortality reduction with our proning group. And by proning, we're flipping them over, we're increasing the surface area for gas exchange because that's the posterior surface. So we're allowing fluid, which ARDS is, is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. We're flipping all the fluid and letting go with gravity and it's going to the front. We're moving the heart off of the left lung a little bit. Um, and by doing that, you're opening up more pathways for gas exchange. Um, it was a technique we used to increase our PO2 just long enough to keep them alive, basically. Rescue strategy. Um, but this one shows that uh, the prone group, the, their mortality was lower, significantly lower. So this may become uh, incorporated into that protocol. Okay. So I hope this was helpful and a quick review. And I appreciate you listening. Any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks so much. Have a good day.